Hallelujah. Uh, good morning, church. Good morning. It's a privilege to share fellowship and um, privilege to bring the word as well. Um, over the past few weeks, uh, we started a series on the kingdom of God and then Keith did a fantastic job of laying everything down, you know, putting all the foundations in the right places for us to build a name. And then he talked about the things that come together and, you know, mix for the expression of the kingdom of God amongst um, God's people and then how it also finds expression and others who are not yet in the kingdom can have an experience of that kingdom. He talks about um, God's righteousness, God's reign, and God's rule. And then he talks about his power, his peace, and his presence, you know. All this comes together to, you know, make for how the kingdom finds expression. And we've been talking around it. Today we're going to be talking about Peace. Our subject of discussion this morning is peace. And there's this lovely statement I like about peace, which says, peace begins with a smile. So if we're talking about peace, I expect every one of us to have a smile on our faces, right? Yeah, peace begins with a smile. A smile will do some good. So I'm going to be talking about peace this morning. Uh, I trust the Lord that God's word will come to us God's word will bless our hearts and God's word will bring to be in us God's desires, God's expectations, and God's blessings. I trust that the Lord will do that this morning as we share together in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, just to a kind of bring definition and concept to peace, what exactly is peace? You know, we there are certain things that are, so to speak, common, but we relate with them differently, maybe by reason of our experiences and expectations and all of that. So when we're talking about peace, what context are we going to be discussing peace this morning? We're going to be discussing peace in that context that puts peace as a state of tranquility, a state of calmness and serenity, a state of contentment in the presence or absence of unrest. Whether there be unrest, that state is there. And in the absence of unrest, that state remains. So in the thick and things of life, that state is undisturbed, that state is unchanged, that state is, you know, maintained throughout. That's the state of peace we're talking about this morning. A peace that transcends, you know, the coordinates of, you know, the negative axis and the positive axis, and it remains in its balance and in its equilibrium. Speaking science now. Now, let's come back to the Bible. What does the Bible say? And how do we have this peace? How, what's the foundation of this peace? What's the basis of this peace? How does this peace come about? Now, we do Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. I'll be reading different simpler versions of the Bible. This is the Amplified Classic, and it puts it this way. Remember that... You were at that time separated, living apart from Christ, excluded from all part in him, utterly estranged and outlaw from the rights of Israel as a nation, and strangers with no share in the sacred compact of the messianic promise, with no knowledge of or right in God's agreements his covenant, and you had no hope, no promise, you were in the world without God. When a man is unsaved, 
This explains where they are as it has to do with the promises of God. They are estranged. They are separated from those promises. They are outlawed from those promises. They have no access to those promises. Those promises are not meant for them. And they can by any means obtain those promises. God's promise are great. God's promise are true. But God's promises are domiciled in a premise. If you want to have an experience of God's promise and God's covenant coming to pass in your life, there is a premise you ought to be. There is a jurisdiction where that operates. And in Colossians 1, 13, the Bible said, God did something for us. When we got saved, he had us translated from the kingdom of darkness, and he established us in the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's such a great thing God did. And now what's the basis of our expectation of this peace, and how do we relate with this peace? It's important to say this and to have this laid out properly so that as Christians, we can actually take our place and obtain the promises of God. Now, what have Jesus got to say about this? John chapter 14 and verse 27, this was Jesus speaking. I said, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Hallelujah. What's a pronouncement of blessing? If there is one thing that is lacking in the world today and will continue to be in scarce supply compared to the demand of it, that is peace. Peace is in high demand, but peace is in short supply. Peace is expensive. Peace is hard to find. Peace is rare. Peace is highly desired. But Jesus coming to us as believers, say to us, I'm not just living, I am living, but I will leave you as well with a gift. If Jesus were to have gone into a shop with me, and I have a full recognition that he was Jesus, and he was going to pick my shopping list, I will be one of the most blessed people on it. Because he's going to pick what applies to my now, and tomorrow, and in the world to come. And in his shopping bag, he now has picked for us an item called peace. He knows what our life was going to look like. He understands how our journeys are going to look like. And he picked this for us and bequeathed it to us as something that will come handy to help in our time of need. I said, I am giving you that gift which is called peace. And he didn't just say peace generally. He said, my peace. Well separated, well distinguished from other kinds of peace. And when he said my peace, he now said to us, not such peace that the world give. Meaning, there are two sources of supply of peace. Jesus is a source, the world also poses as a source. But when you compare the source which is Jesus and the source which is the world, the outcome and the results are different. The world promises peace through the abuse of substances. The world promises peace through alcoholism. The world promises peace through violence. The world promises peace through 
many means, you know, whereas people take to underhanded means and do things that they would not be proud of because they want to have a sort of peace because they are looking for that peace from the world. But for us as believers, we are blessed, we are fortunate, we are distinguished that the source of our peace is an everlasting source who blesses without it becoming a source of sorrow. And that's why the Bible said the blessings of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow. But every peace the world gives is tentative because the end of it is just like what the Bible said. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of destruction. Right now when you step on it, it looks like that's the best thing to do because you can't see the end. If you are like me who have been, you know, in a travel and you got on some road and you thought you were going the right way and you smashed down on your throttle and then you got to some point where the road is not continuing and then you have to make a u-turn you couldn't see the end from the beginning but God who blessed us with such a peace sees the end from the beginning. So he picked for us the best article to travel with through life. I pray that we take a full realization of these blessings and own it and let it find expression in our lives as we discuss this kingdom in Jesus name. Now there are types of peace. The kind of peace which the Lord Jesus gives is that peace which is in our mind and is resident in the core of our being. God's peace resides on our inside. It's a peace established in the depth of our person is a gift that is established that satisfies deeply in us. It's not a peace that wears out like when some guys are in the drunken state, they feel high, feel good, laughing when nothing is funny, but it wears out. This peace resides within and doesn't wear out. Hallelujah. Now, because this peace comes from Jesus, it carries with it his presence, he carries with it that potency to help us to be where he wants us to be in our state of mind. And one of those things which is responsible for a lot of increase in troubles of the mind is the lack of peace. The lack of peace finds expressions in different ways agitations, you know, depressions, anger, you know, and many other things. Sometimes they are the expression of lack of peace. Hallelujah. But that peace which God gives is in the core of our being. And now the second type of peace is the outer peace. Peace that is just established in social spheres, in, you know, in interrelationship between people, such peace that exists when there's cordiality. That's you know, an external form of peace. But I have this to say, which we will find out to be true. Wherever there is a supply of external peace, it is a product of an internal peace. Every external peace is a product of an internal peace. A man who is lacking in peace in their inside, in their inner man, cannot supply peace either in a relationship or in an interaction. They will be angry, you know, and quarrel some people because there is a lack of peace on the inside. And what you do not have, you cannot offer, no matter how good your intentions are. So inner peace 
is the most prized piece because it is the foundation of every lasting external peace. Hallelujah. Now, how do we, you know, come about with these things and managing it well? I like for us to remember this and have this at the back of our mind that Jesus is a giver of peace. And when he gives us peace, that peace is on our inside. As citizens of his kingdom, we are entitled to rights, benefits. Rights and benefits are things we are entitled to because we are now in his kingdom. The Bible talks about us being partakers of the commonwealth of Israel. Ephesians 2, 12, where we read, if you read it in other versions, it summarizes everything that the Amplified tried to break down. The, th those versions summarizes them in a word called the commonwealth of Israel. Now, what we own in common, what we are entitled to, what we, you know, get from God as part of our rights and benefit of being in the kingdom is peace. Peace is your right. Peace is your benefit. Peace for you as a child of God is non-negotiable. You don't have to negotiate to have that peace. It's a peace that has been willed to you. It's a peace that you are entitled to. It's a peace that you rightly own. It's a peace that you deserve. So it's your own peace. Your name is on it. It is designated for you. It is bequeathed to you. Therefore, whatsoever attempts to take that peace from you is trying to rob you of both your right and your benefit. Amen. And that should not stand. Yeah. That should not stand. Just like you have a right to live, you have a right to peace. Just like you have a right to be a child of God, it gives you the right to a peace of mind in your inner being. The devil is aware of this and he tries to set situations to rob us of our peace. Because he knows that what gives us our balance is peace. When peace is not there, we begin to gravitate towards things that makes for satisfaction outside of God. So you see many times he tries to plug in landmines and plug things to rob us of our peace. But as a child of God, we should take a stand in God's presence and make a demand on your peace because that peace is yours and well deserved. Hallelujah. Now, how do we sustain our inner peace? Having received peace from Jesus Christ, having got the gift of peace, having gift, I mean, um, peace as our right and as our benefit, how do we sustain it? Now, it's like this. If you know the generations that didn't have 247 electricity, they'll understand this better. You go to a candle stand and you light a candle and you want to transport that candle to the other end of the room. It changes how you move, sometimes how you breathe, and how you step. Why are you doing that? You try all you can to let the burning of the candle be sustained because it could be snuffed out. If you didn't know exactly what to do, you might lose the light on the candle before you have the candle on a candle stand. 
So sustaining the peace is looking at how we can guard our peace, how we can let our peace remain, and how our peace can blossom, and how our peace will not be rubbed off from us and leaving us in a state of restless agitation. So we want to look at how we could do that, and there are practical ways to have that done. One of them ways we could do that first is to deal with unforgiveness. A person who wants to sustain peace must be a person who is very forgiven. If you are not a very forgiving person, people and outside situations and circumstances are going to rob you of your peace. Now you go into your car and then you drive in the traffic and then you are a righteous man, you're a calm person, you're giving your family the best ride, your missus that came through much prayer is sitting there on your side, your kids that you love so well are sitting right behind there and it's fun and suddenly within that traffic comes a guy rushing at you carelessly and wanting to swap anyhow. Now you have your prized possessions in your care and you want to deliver them safely and then these guys rush at you. You might just lose your cool. What's that? And then you go Ank! and God bless you don't say a bad word. <laughs> They say, Holy Spirit, help me. <laughs> All those are external circumstances that you don't have a control about. But you have a control about yourself. If you put yourself in control, external situations cannot control you. And one of those ways to put yourself in control of your peace is to be a very forgiving person. I read a passage in Luke 23 verse 34 from the Good News Bible. Jesus said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they are doing. They divided his clothes among themselves by throwing dice. Do these guys look like they don't know what they do? I mean, they are throwing dice, they are dividing stuff. They look like they are well-informed people who can make a decision. But Jesus made a huge excuse for them and said they don't know what they do. And he forgave them. And the Bible said, while we are yet sinners, that was when Christ died. He didn't wait for us to make a change. He didn't wait for an apology. He didn't wait for us to have a rethink. While we were in the midst of it, while we were carrying it on happily, he has forgiven us already. That's what he did. And that's the kind of forgiveness he expects from us. And that's why whatsoever happened to Jesus, he never said a bad word, he never was at the mercy of an external situation and circumstance. If you read anything about crucifixion, crucifixion still remains one of the most horrible form of death penalty. Without any form of mercy, without any, you know, mitigation of violence with human feeling. A man is subjected to a process, a process that is not meant to kill him quick, remove his head, he's dead. But it's a process that is meant to kill him slowly over a prolonged period with pains unmitigated against his spirit, soul, and body. A Roman writer have this to say, a historic writer. He said crucifixion was such a death that you dare not even wish it for a Roman citizen. It's that horrible. He went through it. He went through the denials. He went through the betrayers. How does it feel when Jesus 
looked over his shoulder in the pains of crucifixion and he could see Judas Iscariot standing there. How does he feel that he looked over his shoulder in the pains and in the heat of it? There was a Peter denying him by the side. Those were very heartbreaking situations. But they didn't move him. He had a peace that external situations couldn't change. Because he's forgiven them already. He found a space to forgive them. If we are able to forgive like Jesus, the world would have been a better place. But sometimes we want reprisal. Sometimes we want a payback. Sometimes we want the vengeance. And God had this to say to us humans, knowing our tendency. He said, let me handle the vengeance. He said, vengeance is mine. He wants us to leave it in his care. Your peace won't last long if you are not very forgiving. Unforgiveness is a quick way that uproots peace. Another way to sustain our peace is to be a person of prayer. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 in the New Living Translation have this to say. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Don't worry about anything. Whatsoever becomes a reason to worry should rather become a reason to pray. If it's what you worry, much more it is what you're praying. If we pray as much as we worry, we'll have peace in our situations. He said, Whatsoever it is, pray and be thankful. And while you do that, you will experience God's peace, which is beyond any understanding. A peace that is beyond what anybody could just interpret. The situation might not have changed, but you've got peace. The prayer might not have been yet answered, but you've got peace. You are still hoping, but you've got peace. It is still hot, but you've got peace. It is still painful, but you've got peace. It is hard, but your peace remains. That's how to go through the fire and not be burned. That's how not to wear your situation on your face. In the midst of it, you are prayed. And in the midst of peace, it you've got peace. You are rest assured. Hallelujah. To sustain our peace, we need to learn to trust God. That word is carefully chosen. Learn to trust God because trusting God, it's not on autopilot. <laughs> it's not automatic. Learning to trust God is a discipline. You know, before Jesus said to Peter, come on the waters. Peter had seen Jesus do other things like turning water into wine. So he could trust Jesus. If that was the first time he was meeting Jesus, he could have doubted if he knew nothing about Jesus. So we learn to trust God. Hallelujah. It, 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 so wherever you are on that curve, that's not the issue. Where you're going is what matters. You might find it really hard right now to trust God. It's a point in the curve as well. Hallelujah. And this is what the Bible has got to say. You will guard him and keep him in perfect and constant peace whose mind 
both its inclination and its character is stayed on you because he commits himself to you, leans on you, and hopes confidently in you. That is Isaiah 26, 3. God keeps a man in peace whose heart and the inclination thereof and the character of his heart is stayed on God. God keeps him in peace. His peace is not robbed of and taken who trusts in God. If you learn to trust God, if you want to believe God, God, by reason of you doing that, ministers peace to you and keeps your heart in a state of peace. You know, Job went through a lot. But there was a statement Job made in Job 14.14. 14. He said, all the days of my life, I will wait until my change comes. A person who hopes on God, who believes in God, is unmoved and unshaken in the midst of the storm. If your faith and hope and confidence and trust is in God, you have put your anchor on a ground that cannot be shaken. And as the wind and the tempest sea rises, God keeps you steady because your anchor of trust is on him. I know my Redeemer lives and he will come for me. One day he's going to stand upon the face of the earth. These were things Job kept saying in the midst of his pains, losing his wealth, losing his children, and about to lose his life, and about to lose the social relationship between him and his wife. At some point the wife saw no reason why a man should go through such pain and still want to be alive. And he suge she suggested to Job, why don't you curse God and die? It was, it's better you are dead than going through all of these pains. But Job has his confidence and trust in God so much that the loss of his seven children, the loss of his wealth, the pains of his sores, and the sicknesses that were not getting treated and getting healed couldn't change this man's view of God. Your experience is not above and more Truthful than the word of God. Your experience should not become your theologian. Your experience shouldn't tell you what God is rather than the word. Have your confidence in God. I'm going through this now, but I know God is going to come through for me. It's painful right now. I believe God that is going to come through. A person who have that confidence and that trust in God, you may not have even seen a sign of it. The Bible said, it may not rain, neither will there be wind, but this valley shall be filled with water. Sometimes there are no reason to believe in God, but choose to believe in God still, because God is faithful. Lastly, Meditate on God's word. In your trials and in your situations, meditate on God's word. Psalm 103 verse 5 in Amplified Classic said this, Bless affectionately, gratefully praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not one of all his benefits. Hallelujah. Learn to meditate on God's word. Learn to carry God's word within your heart. Learn to anchor your thinking around God's word. Andy said something last time that you know was quite funny but very interesting. He said meditation is the other side like worrying about God's word. You know, worry about it. Whatsoever you want to think about, think about it around what God has said. Don't let yourself slip into the depth of hopelessness that brings about anxiety, that brings about fear, that brings about you feeling left alone and God abandoning you. The Bible says, in his promise to us, I will neither leave you nor forsake you. 
Whether you feel he's there or you don't feel like he's there, I speak to you by the word of God. God is there. Think about the word of God. All his benefits. What you don't have now. It's part of your benefit in him. Think about it. That one day God's going to come true for me. Someday God's going to do this. Someday I'm going to have, you know, a reason to testify that God came true. And God does it. Hallelujah. He does it. Meditate on God's word. And I read Philippians 3.13, which is the last place before we pray. It says, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. What is behind can only bring about regret. What is ahead brings hope and fulfillment. Worrying about what is behind won't help. Some people are so tied down by what is behind. What they've done before they came into Christ. What they've been through. Who has done what? You are traveling forward, but your compass is facing backward. That's not how to travel right. You are not going far with that. And some guys are pulling a baggage from the ages. That's not how to go with God. Someone's done that to you. And they are gone traveling through their life. But you pitch your tent where they did you what they did. That's not how to have peace. And some guys spend all night thinking, why did they do that? Why did they say that? Why did I deserve it? What did I do wrong? Worrying about so many things you can't control. It's happened, it's done, close the chapter and open a new one. God is saying something new. I say forget the former things. Try to forget them. Try to walk away from them. Try not to go back there. Don't let your mind go on a backward journey while you want to set your life on a forward course. Learn to let go. Learn to forget what is gone. Learn to walk away. Sometimes the best way to win is to walk away. Learn to do that. It can be hard. Some people build monuments on their painful experiences. When that time of the year comes, you pay time and attention to the pains. You awaken the pain, you nurse the pain again, you give it more life, and then you start walking away from the venoms. You try half year, you try to forget it, and as the circle of life comes back, that date on your calendar rings an alarm. As it's approaching, the pain is waking back up. This is the time to bury it. This is the time to deal with it. And that's why the Bible have got this to say, which is our prayer item now. Now, not tomorrow. May the Lord of peace himself give you his peace. That's a good place to say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times. And in every situation, the Lord be with you all. Peace at all times. Peace in every situation. When will that happen? Timeline on that says now. Not tomorrow. Right here, right now, God is able to give a peace that is timeless and gives a peace that is not situation bound. Can someone clap to God? Right now, as we are standing upon this mountain, your pains can be dealt with once and for all. That which have robbed you of your peace, sowed pains in your heart, taking you back to cry many times. Right now, right here, God is here to handle it.
And that's why we're going to pray and say, Lord, I want a peace right here, right now. A peace that, you know, times cannot change and situations cannot change. And he said, it should be with how many of us, please? All of us, Amen. including our children. Yeah. All of us, including our livestock. God made a promise to the house of Israel. He said, none shall be barren amongst you. It happened that even their livestock were not barren. Yeah. Livestock? How much children? God's peace for you is for you and your children. And the Bible said, now may the Lord of peace himself, not me. You are not coming unto me. You're not coming unto Andy. You're not coming unto the gateway. You are coming unto the Lord himself who defines himself, introduces himself by his word as the Lord of peace. Hallelujah. He's not just the mighty God. He's the Lord of peace. He's the giver of peace. He's rich in peace. He's not lacking in peace. With him, peace is always there to give. Now is the time to pray. If you have a need to take back your peace, this is that time. Can we rise on our feet to pray? If your peace is challenged, now is the time to ask the Lord of peace, give me my peace back. I want my peace back. Pains be gone. My peace, I take it now. Can you pray and ask the Lord? Give me my peace. I take my peace, Lord. Minister your peace to my heart. You are the Lord of peace. You are the giver of peace. I said now, not tomorrow. Now is that time. Now is that hour. God gives peace. God gives peace. You are able, Lord. You do what no man can do. You do what no man can do. Minister peace this morning. Lord, minister peace. As many as are praying for peace, Lord. Show yourself to them as the Lord of peace. Manifest yourself as the Lord of peace. Oh God, if there's anyone needing peace, let them not go without one. You said for all of us, stretch forth your hands, Lord. Stretch forth your hands, Lord. We're happy to pray with anyone. You have been in a circle of losing your peace. Who has struggled with having peace and haven't found. Who is so much in need of peace. But have peace in very scarce supply. We are happy to stand with you right here, right now. And we bring the word of God to you. That God, who is the God of peace, is happy to give you peace right now. And that peace is not bound by time. And that peace is not bound by situations. If you are one of such persons, we are happy to pray with you. Have the courage to move forward. Don't be bound by your pains. Don't be robbed of your visitation. God is able to do it. He is able, more than able, to do much more than I could ever think. He is able, more than able. To make me what he wants me to be. He is able. He's more than able. He can do much more than I can ever dream. My God is able. He's more than able. To make me what he wants me to be. Your God is able. He's more than able. 
Jesus can do much more than you could ever think. He's able more than able. He can make you what he wants you to be. Oh yeah. Zashkata labushkalia. Jala brada hushkalia. Zebre de shakala brudu shakaba. E shakala brudu shkaya baradada. Zebre de shakala brudu shkalia. to stretch out our hands to the Lord I'm going to pray a blessing may the peace of God that transcends that's bigger than all understanding guard your minds in Christ Jesus now and forevermore and the power of the Holy Spirit come and give you peace in every situation may he come and bless you with his peace May what, what Omodachi has taught us this morning, may this be fuel for this week to help us to guard our peace, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us with your peace and enable us to guard our peace as we go out into the world. Enable us to bring peace, to bubble over the peace that you've put in us to those around us. May the people that you work with, may the people that you interact with this week experience the peace that you carry. May they encounter and begin to counter the love of Jesus because you are exuding an overflowing peace in every circumstance. Guard our hearts, guard our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need prayer this morning for peace, we'd love to pray for you. Do come to the front. Otherwise, we've got tea and coffee and whatnot out the back. So enjoy fellowship together. But if you want prayer, do come forward. We'd love to pray with you. Otherwise, God bless you.